Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to my PhD defense on modeling timbre for neural singing synthesis. And before starting, I would like to give a, a deep thank you to all the committee members that are here today, and also to my co-supervisors and uh, to the department. So I, I would like to start with an uh, outline of the talk and at the same time explain a little bit the title of the thesis. So uh, I will start to give some uh, background information on singing synthesis in general. Then I will talk a little bit about the approach that we take for uh, modeling timbre uh, in, in neural singing synthesis. And then the first part of the talk is about different ways to model timbre and focusing especially on fast and stable inference. And we have three different works in this part uh, that correspond to different uh, chapters in the thesis. So one is about autoregressive modeling, then non-autoregressive modeling, and finally non-autoregressive modeling of uh, waveform. And the second part of the talk is uh, about data efficient and reduced effort force creation. And again, here there are three works that correspond to different chapters in the thesis. The first is about voice cloning. The second is about uh, a way to reduce annotations when modeling timbre. And finally, uh, a method for semi-supervised modeling of timbre. And in the end, I will give some conclusions. So to start with the background, uh, singing synthesis is a technology that's currently mainly used as a tool in music production. It has seen a surge in popularity in the last 10 to 15 years. And uh, one of the big reasons for this is that uh, at the beginning of that time, um, some commercial software was released, such as uh, Yamaha's Vocaloid, that allows users to create synthetic vocals. And actually, Vocaloid is one of the main reasons why uh, I, I chose this topic for my PhD, because uh, since 2004, I've been working uh, in the MTG, uh, in industrial research projects with Yamaha uh, on singing synthesis and Vocaloid in particular. And another reason why this technology uh, has been quite popular is because there are now uh, a lot of surrounding cultural phenomena uh, around this technology. So these things uh, include like a collaborative uh, creation of media, uh, concerts, video games, merchandising. So there's a lot of kind of surrounding activity. The, the quality that we can obtain using this kind of existing commercial software is already good enough to be used in commercial music. However, uh, creating songs still requires a lot of expert work. Creating voices requires a lot of expert work. And also the results are quite heavily dependent on the language. So for uh, languages such as Japanese, the results are a lot better than for English. And finally, the, the range of musical styles is quite limited. So I also want to place my work a little bit in a historical context. So I started the PhD in 2017. And at the time, the, the main approach um, to singing synthesis was concatenative synthesis that started around the year 2000. So in this uh, method, we have an inventory of small speech waveform segments, uh, usually diphones. And then we select, transform, and concatenate these segments to match the target sequence. And some um, important years here are 2007, when uh, the second version of Vocaloid was released, and also Hatsune Miku was released, which is uh, the most famous virtual singer still to this date. And um, an idea of the dominance of this technology in, in 2016, so one year before starting the PhD, it's still uh, one uh, singing synthesis challenge at Interspeech. So some of the pros of this technique are that the quality can be quite good, and it was state of the art when starting the PhD. But some of the cons are that diphones are too limited for languages such as English, and we require specialized recordings, uh, and timbre and expression cannot be modeled at the same time, but are usually modeled disjointly. And in general, it's not a very flexible method. 
So um, in parallel, a little bit later from 2006, uh, people also started to use hidden Markov model based synthesis. So this is a machine learning approach uh, based on a graphical model. Uh, however, it has a very explicit structure. So for instance, uh, each phoneme is modeled as a small number of state with, states with constant statistics within each state. And also then uh, these states are clustered in different contexts, uh, which usually leads to uh, a lot of averaging. One important year is uh, 2010 when Cinci was uh, released, which is one of the more uh, famous HMM-based singing synthesizers. And some of the pros of this approach are that it's quite flexible. It can be trained on natural singing and timbre and expression can be modeled jointly. However, the quality is quite poor, especially due to uh, averaging of the acoustic parameters. And it's also a method that's quite complicated in theory and practice. So making any kind of meaningful change requires a lot of uh, work and actually training the models is quite difficult. So in parallel to uh, the developments in singing synthesis in the field of text to speech, uh, people started to shift towards deep learning. So prior to 2016, uh, people were using deep learning, but it was just becoming kind of on par to unit selection or concatenative synthesis, but it was not yet uh, clearly better. However, then in 2016, uh, WaveNet was released, which is the first time that uh, deep learning results are clearly better than competing approaches. And one year later, uh, Tacotron 2 showed that the results can be indistinguishable from recordings and listening tests. So this uh, leads to my first research question, which is how can similar approaches also advance the field of singing synthesis? And besides uh, singing synthesis techniques uh, or models, the voice creation is also a, an important topic. So usually voice creation is a bottleneck in many applications for singing synthesis. And uh, this is because most of the approaches require accurate phonetic labeling and segmentation of the recordings. And this is something that usually has to be done uh, by hand or at least partially by hand. And it requires a lot of time and expert knowledge. So just to give an example for a state-of-the-art concatenative synthesizer, creating a new voice can take a specialist up to six months of work. So the second question is, how can deep learning approaches reduce the voice creation effort? So I will now talk a little bit about the approach that we take. So uh, we define the task of singing synthesis as generating a sung vocal waveform given an input score with lyrics. And we model a specific singer's voice and singing style. So doing this, uh, modeling this uh, transformation in a single step is quite difficult. So we're, uh, this is because we go from a very high level description to very detailed data. And in general, uh, working with waveforms is quite problematic. So uh, they have a very high dimensionality. There's a complicated relation between time steps and they have quite an indirect uh, relation to perception. So one simplification that we make is to not predict the waveform directly, but predict intermediate acoustic features such as uh, world vocoder features or male spectrogram. And then we have a second model, which is called the vocoder that predicts the final waveform. There's still an issue that this first model has to model all aspects of singing. So this includes, for instance, uh, timing, pitch, timbre, and other aspects. So this, of course, makes the modeling itself a little bit more difficult, but it especially complicates the evaluation. So if all of these aspects can change at the same time, comparing uh, two examples becomes very difficult. So another simplification that we make is to separate uh, this first model into different components. So we have one, at least one model uh, that's responsible for timing, one for pitch and one for timbre. It can be uh, more aspects such as uh, loudness or other kind of expressive uh, aspects of singing. But this is kind of the, the minimum set. 
And in our work, we focus mostly on the timbre part. So this includes the, the timbre model itself and also the vocoder. And another technique that we apply a lot in our work is so-called performance-driven synthesis. So in this case, instead of extracting timing and pay or uh, estimating time and, and pitch uh, using uh, models, we extract them from a reference recording. So um, in this case, the kind of the expression of the of the synthesis will be uh, taken from a recording, so it will be very good, and then we can focus only on the timbre aspect. I will play a short example of uh, a recent performance-driven synthesizer just to get an idea of uh, what kind of quality can, we can uh, obtain. This model is a little bit newer than the, the ones discussed in, in my thesis. One wicked thing to say You never felt this way What a wicked thing to do to make me dream of you No, I don't want to fall in love Okay, so now we've reached the, the first part, which is about different ways of modeling timbre. So inspired by, by WaveNet, we first investigated autoregressive modeling. So uh, one of the key problems is uh, modeling a joint distribution over many time steps uh, and this is a very difficult problem so what autoregressive models do is uh, factorize this joint probability into a product of um, conditional uh, probabilities where each time step is conditioned on all the previous time steps and this is a much easier problem and then at synthesis uh, we sample one time step and feed it back to the to the input to predict the next time step. So our model and architecture closely follows WaveNet, and some of the contributions are extension to 2D features, extension to multiple feature streams. So if we use, uh, for instance, world vocoder features, there might be features related to uh, harmonic. Uh, aspects of the signal and aperiodic, aperiodic aspects of the signal. We propose a way to uh, mitigate overfitting that happens easily with these kind of features. We propose a way to do a frequency dependent sampling temperature. So this means that we can have uh, low frequencies that are more deterministic and high frequencies that are more stochastic. And just in general, an extension to singing synthesis. So uh, we use slightly different control features and, of course, different data sets. Later, we extended this uh, system to a full singing synthesizer. So we have the timbre model that we just uh, discussed. And we have a, a pitch model that predicts F0, which is uh, very similar. It's the same model, just with different hyperparameters and different uh, inputs and outputs. And we have a phonetic timing model, which in this case is a simple feed forward network with some heuristics. So the results here are that the autoregressive timbre model is significantly preferred over concatenative and HMM baselines. The autoregressive full synthesizer is rated notably above concatenative HMM and a simple DNM baseline. And some of the conclusions are that uh, a sufficiently powerful deep learning model can produce state-of-the-art quality singing synthesis. It is a very flexible approach, so it can be trained on natural singing, for instance. And the amount of data is quite comparable to competitive systems. And also, it's quite a, a suitable approach for many practical applications, so the computational complexity and memory footprint are quite uh, reasonable. So now we get to the second uh, type of model that we tried for timbre modeling, which is a non autoregressive model. So this is mainly because of some shortcomings in autoregressive modeling. And one of those is a discrepancy between training and inference. So in training, the past time steps uh, that we feed to the network are ground truth time steps. So uh, uh, samples from the, from the data set. And 
And if we have a powerful model, it can quite easily overfit to this kind of perfect data. However, in inference, uh, the past time steps are actually samples from the model that include some, some errors usually. So now uh, our model is not very robust to these kind of errors. And what usually happens is that it partially ignores the control inputs. So it means that it starts to mispronounce, for instance. And one way to mitigate this is to introduce some uh, noise during training. So it can be input noise, or we can have some dropout in the network. And another issue is that because it's kind of a feedback system, it has a potential to be kind of unstable. And usually what happens is that there are some uh, un unnatural swelling or decaying resonances, often in kind of long vowels. So here's an example of that. In the fake place. So this is a kind of artifact that's a little bit specific to autoregressive models. Then finally, uh, a shortcoming is that inference in autoregressive models is sequential and thus uh, it cannot be parallelized uh, fully on GPU hardware. And non-autoregressive models do not have these issues. So training and inference is exactly the same and there's no feedback connection. Uh, however, uh, modeling each time step as conditionally independent has some downsides. So uh, typically this results in oversmoothing, so excessive averaging or noisy samples, so uh, excessive variance. And what also happens is that timbre can kind of shift over time. So um, it, it can become incoherent and there can be kind of fluctuations in loudness and, and so on. So these issues can be mitigated in different ways. So one way is to have a different training objective, for instance, using a gun to reduce oversmoothing. Or we can also try to find a network ar architecture that has some favorable inductive biases. And this is the, the type of approach that we will investigate here. So we have a non-autoregressive model that's based on fetch, fast speech for text-to-speech, which itself is based on the transformer network for NLP. Some of the contributions here are uh, adaptation to singing. So the architecture is a little bit different and the control signals are different. And also we have a focus, uh, especially on improving timbrical coherence. Uh, uh, I have to mention that this, uh, this model was designed also with a different goal in mind, which is reducing the data set annotations needed. And this will be discussed later. So some of the contributions of this model are in, in that section. Um, so compared to the autoregressive model, we have a phoneme level encoder. Then these uh, phoneme level features are repeated according to uh, the phoneme durations to have, their, have the length match the acoustic features. Then we have a decoder, which is kind of similar to the autoregressive model. So it's, it's a kind of a stack of convolutional layers, except that here we have a, a interleave of attention layers and convolutional layers. I would like to talk a bit more about the attention layers. So in this case, it's a self-attention layer. So this is an operation where each of the output time steps is a weighted average of all input time steps. And the weights are determined by a score function, which in our case is the, the scale dot product, which is uh, closely related to cosine similarity. Then there are some linear transformations that allow the self-attention to focus on different aspects of the input. And in our case, we improve locality by adding a diagonal Gaussian bias. So assuming that uh, self-attention is an operation that operates on all time steps and works by similarity, what we want to uh, investigate is whether this self-attention can provide an inductive bias that improves the temporal coherence. So the results are that in this case, the non-autoregressive model is rated a little bit higher than the autoregressive baseline. And using self-attention does result in a no notable improvement uh, over an otherwise identical non-autoregressive non model. So we'll play a short example here of 
uh, synthesis without self-attention and the model with self-attention. You know you're something special and you look like you're the best. So maybe you noticed a little bit of fluctuations in, in the levels, especially in here with self-attention. You know you're something special and you look like you're the best. Okay, so it's more consistent, I would say. So uh, the conclusions are that with a suitable architecture, non autoregressive models can be an alternative to autoregressive models. Self tension is a useful mechanism for improving thermical coherence, and the lack of feedback makes the system more stable. So uh, avoiding these issues, non autoregressive models may be a useful platform for future research. And the final work in this part is, uh, is a non autoregressive model for waveform generation. So now that we have a non autoregressive timbre model, we also want a non autoregressive waveform generation or a neural vocoder. So in this case, it's important that it's non autoregressive because autoregressive waveform generation tends to be very slow. And this is because there's a high sample rate and a high computational complexity per time step. So non autoregressive neural vocoders uh, obtain quite good results for text to speech, and there are many different ways to do this, but most are based on GANs. However, applying approaches from text to speech to singing tends to result in some artifacts. So one typical artifact is discontinuities in long vowels, especially uh, we'll play an example of that. Bring. And commonly this is mitigated by feeding a periodic excitation to the network. Another common uh, artifact is phasiness or buzziness, especially in low pitches. And this might be due to an incorrect uh, phase response. Um, I will also play an example. Oops. If I reach out to thee. And finally, one artifact is uh, quasi periodic pulses in envoy segments that can sound kind of metallic. And this might be uh, related to artifacts of learned upsampling. So I will play a very short example. This row, this row. So we propose a model where we can ensure minimum phase and also avoid any learned upsampling. And the model is based on the world vocoder signal model. So we have uh, our harmonic source and the aperiodic source, and then uh, two time varying filters. And then these two signals are summed to produce the output waveform. In this case, the filters are a combination of a vocal tract filter and an aperiodicity filter. The aperiodicity filter is basically an interpolation between the harmonic signal and the aperiodic signal. And then we use F0 to compute the, the harmonic signal and the filters are computed using uh, the MEL spectrogram that then goes through a neural network and some heuristics to calculate the filters and they are ensured to be minimum phase by capsule transform. We also use a capsule lifter to have an additional loss that makes sure that the vocal or that the filters are quite smooth. We have a multi-resolution STFT loss between the target audio and the output audio. And we have a discriminator that provides adversarial losses and a feature matching loss. And these adversarial losses are especially useful for kind of recovering from voice on voice errors. So the results are that this vocoder is rated higher than the traditional world vocoder, which is based just on signal processing. Uh, it's rated also higher than the excited parallel wavegan approach, which is kind of a typical baseline from text to speech adapted to singing. Uh, however, it's rated slightly below a very strong autoregressive baseline, sometimes lacking a little bit of uh, presence. So the conclusions are that it fixes most shortcomings of the world vocoder. Uh, it has good quality, although not the absolute best. It's quite a fast approach. It can be 200 times real time on GPU and a little bit under 10 times real time on CPU. 
and it also works well as a universal vocoder. So this means that we can train it on a multi-speaker data set and then use it for any new uh, voice. So here's, for instance, a demo where the speaker is unseen and also the language is unseen. So uh, I think this is a practical solution for many applications. There is, however, a limit uh, due to certain model assumptions. So for if we want to uh, generate non-model voices, such as uh, growl voices or harsh voices, it will not work very well. So uh, now we get to the second part of the talk, which is about data efficient and reduced effort voice creation. So uh, Improving data efficiency means reducing the amount of data required to create a voice and reducing the effort means basically uh, reducing the amount of annotations that are required for, for the data set. So we first investigated uh, voice cloning technique, which is a way to improve data efficiency. And of course, if we uh, reduce the amount of data needed, even if this data has to be fully annotated, uh, we still reduce the voice creation effort. Uh, this is useful for applications where we cannot easily get more data, such as a deceased singer, uh, or applications that require fast training, such as creating user voices on a server, or applications that require many different timbres, such as choir singing. So um, Voice cloning has been shown to be quite effective for text-to-speech, so we wanted to see if this can also be applied to singing synthesis and what kind of data is ideal for this purpose. So voice cloning uh, tries to, as first a step that's called pre-training, that tries to leverage information from many different singers. So we have a model where all of the weights are shared between all of the singers, and the only thing that's different is uh, a set of speaker embeddings, one for each singer. And these speaker embeddings are usually vectors uh, of maybe 16 numbers or something like that. Then in the second step, if we want to learn a new voice, we keep all of the shared weights fixed, but we just learn a new speaker embedding. So because these are just uh, 16 numbers, for instance, we can assume that we will require only a few training examples to learn this speaker embedding. And uh, a final step can be a full uh, system fine tuning. So in this case, we fine tune the, both the shared weights and the speaker embedding using the few examples of the target speaker. But uh, the trick here is to only do a small number of updates uh, in order to avoid overfitting to the, to the target speaker. So the main contribution here is in the different experiments that we did. So uh, we wanted to see how effective voice cloning is in singing synthesis. Uh, for this, we compared voices cloned with two to three minutes of data, voices trained from scratch on two to three minutes of data, voices trained on a full data set, which usually is more than one hour of data. And we wanted to see what kind of recordings have the best results. So we compared natural singing, which is just uh, normal songs, to uh, what we call pseudo singing, which is kind of in between singing and speech, and it's singing at a constant pitch and cadence. I will play a short example. Oh, ex nupcial, mejor dicho. And we also wanted to see the, the application to choir synthesis, where we usually require many different timbres. So these experiments uh, span multiple languages, including Japanese, English, Spanish, and Catalan. And they also span multiple multi-speaker data set sizes, uh, ranging from eight to 35 speakers for the pre-training step. So the results here are that uh, voice cloning is highly preferred over voices trained on few data from scratch. Voice cloning is rated on par to voices trained on full data sets. Voice cloning is rated on par, or, or choir of clone voices is rated on par to a choir of full dataset voices. And for multi-speaker pre-training using pseudo singing as the best results. And 
we think that this might be because uh, this kind of pseudo singing has very uh, consistent pronunciation. So it might be good for that. And for fine tuning, using natural singing data has the best results. And this is obviously because the uh, uh, natural singing is closer to the target that we want to obtain. So the conclusions are that voice cloning is simple yet effective for singing synthesis. As little as two to three minutes of data gives uh, reasonable results, and it's quite widely applicable. So we'll play a short example of uh, choir synthesis with 12 voices, and two thirds of the voices are cloned on less than three minutes of data. Okay, so the next work is about reducing the, an, reducing the annotations required uh, to make a timbre model. So the annotations are a, a bottleneck in voice creation. So we usually require phoneme level timing annotations. And the solution in text-to-speech is to use unaligned uh, text and audio pairs, <clears throat> and then use a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model with attention to during training, learn the alignment between text and audio and during synthesis, uh, predict the alignment. However, if we apply this approach to singing synthesis, uh, we have found that learning the alignment is quite difficult. And this might be because some of the inductive biases from text-to-speech do not hold. So for instance, the average speed rate uh, will, be, will be quite different. Uh, also, it might be that it is an issue of the data set size. So usually for, for singing synthesis, the, the data set sizes can be an order of magnitude smaller than for, for text-to-speech. And we have found that for non autoregressive models, uh, this becomes even more difficult. So our solution for singing synthesis is to exploit the fact that the alignment is heavily constrained by the musical score. So we use uh, no timings or vowel onsets to guide the attention. So uh, instead of labeling all phoneme onsets, we label only the vowel onsets. So again, we use the same model as in the non autoregressive uh, timbre model. The main difference is that instead of inputting a timed phonetic sequence, we input a score with lyrics. And then we have a duration model uh, which in this case is a very simple model, just a lookup table of like average uh, phoneme durations. And the process then is as follows. So we have the input score, then the duration model predicts an initial uh, phonetic timing estimate. Then we have the decoder, which is a stack of self-attention and convolutional layers and we get the output acoustic features. So now if we were to segment these, uh, this output, we might see that the phonetic timings of the output are different from the phonetic timings predicted by the duration model. So this means that the decoder will implicitly learn to correct phonetic timings. So the results here are that this approach is rated only slightly worse than using ground truth uh, phoneme durations. And using self-attention improves the mean opinion score uh, quite a lot. So, uh, however, this is mostly due to the improvement in general uh, timbrical coherence and less so due to the observed timing correction. So the conclusions are that this approach is one way to reduce the annotation effort with only a slight decrease in performance and using a simple speaker independent duration model works. And if we use a better model, we can assume that this will reduce the quality gap. And one downside is that we still require a somewhat accurate note or vowel onset annotations. So creating a voice is still uh, some amount of work. So this leads to our final uh, work, which is about semi-supervised modeling of timbre. So the question is, what if we could create a new voice from audio only without any annotations? 
So we want to go from supervised training where we have controls and targets for in the data set to unsupervised training where we only have acoustic data in the data set. So what can we already do? So we can uh, obtain kind of phonetic content features from an autoencoding autoencoder bottleneck, usually using uh, vector quantization or self-supervised uh, training, something like that. And uh, this kind of technique is used a lot in non-parallel voice conversion to control a target voice with any input voice. So in principle, we can train a decoder in an unsupervised manner using only audio. So what's still missing then is the ability to use linguistic control inputs at inference. So our idea is to use supervised training once to obtain a speaker independent linguistic encoder. And then at inference, use this encoder with the decoder trained for the target voice. So now what we need is a way to uh, use both of these encoders, acoustic and linguistic with the same decoder. And the approach we take is a multi-step approach. So the first step is supervised training with a multi-speaker data set. So we have an acoustic encoder and the encoder is a non-causal wave net. And we have a decoder that produces the, the input acoustic features. So we just have a, a reconstruction loss to try to uh, recreate the input features as, as well as possible. And we also have a linguistic encoder that takes as input the phonetic sequence uh, as a one-hot encoding. And the encoder is also a non-causal wave net. And in the bottleneck of this kind of autoencoder setup, we have a, a random switch between the two encoders or the two codes and a loss between the two codes. So at the same time, we want the two codes to be as similar as possible. And we also want the decoder to be able to reconstruct the, the acoustic features using either of the two codes. Then we add some noise to the codes to encode less spectral detail and improve the coherence over time. And we have uh, autoregressive uh, wave net uh, as part of the decoder, which is very similar to our initial autoregressive model. And we have another wave net with, which is non-causal and has a big receptive field that tries to integrate some uh, information over time. So for instance, uh, phonetic context and so on. Then the decoder is conditioned on speaker embedding and F0. And the second step is to do a supervised training of the target speaker. So we take the pre-trained acoustic encoder, which is speaker independent, and then we train only the decoder on the target speaker data. And the third step is to do inference from linguistic input. So this is when we do synthesis, we take the pre-trained linguistic encoder, which is speaker independent, and we, train the, and we take the pre-trained decoder for the target speaker. And then we can uh, at the same time train on audio and synthesize from linguistic features. So the results here are that semi-supervised training is only slightly worse than supervised training. It works quite well when combined with uh, voice cloning. The results were even slightly better. And this might be because if we have a small amount of data, uh, any errors in annotations uh, will be very significant. And uh, the semi-supervised approach might be more coherent. And I can play a small example of uh, a voice trained with supervised training uh, versus a voice trained with semi-supervised training. Scare myself to death. This was supervised and now semi-supervised. Scare myself to death. So the conclusions are that it has uh, great potential to speed up voice creation. It's a system agnostic approach. So it's basically a training strategy that could be applied to different uh, network architectures, for instance. Uh, the minor reduction in quality might be offset with the ability to create more data a lot easier. So if we do not have to do any annotations, we can just record uh, one hour more. Uh, 
One downside of this approach might be that uh, there can be some effect on the speaker identity reproduction and also the pronunciation. Um, however, there are many applications where this is not so relevant. So uh, now for the conclusions. So uh, regarding the first question, which was how can similar approaches to deep learning models used in text-to-speech also advance the field of singing synthesis. The summary is that autoregressive uh, lear deep learning models can exceed traditional approaches, both in quality and flexibility. So we can, for instance, train on natural singing or do many other things that are not possible with traditional approaches. Um, non autoregressive models can be an alternative to autoregressive models and they provide faster and more stable inference. And here using self-attention can improve uh, temporal coherence. Uh, non autoregressive neural vocoders can be a practical solution for singing synthesis. Uh, we propose a vocoder based on a simple source filter model, and this avoids common artifacts of neural vocoders for text-to-speech applied to singing, and at the same time avoids most of the limitations of traditional vocoders. And uh, another benefit is that the inference can be very fast. Regarding the second question, which is uh, how can deep learning approaches reduce the voice creation effort? The summary is that voice cloning can, be, can effectively reduce the data required to create new voices. And as little as two to three minutes of data can obtain quite reasonable results. It's effective in a wide range of settings, uh, different languages, different types of singing, choir, solo singing. And for pre-training, pseudo singing has the best results. And for fine-tuning, natural singing has the best results. The required data annotations for creating a timbre model can be reduced using our proposed approach. So uh, in this case, we go from phoneme level annotations to node level annotations, and the results are quite co close, albeit slightly worse. And finally, semi-supervised training can be effective in singing synthesis. Uh, so once we have a speaker independent component trained, we can create uh, new voices from audio only without any annotations. And the results are quite close to super uh, supervised training. So some of the limitations of our work uh, are that the scope was limited just to timbre, which is just one small aspect of uh, singing synthesis. And arguably uh, all of the part related to expression is equally or even more important. Uh, so in listening tests, there's still some gap between the ground truth and synthetic examples. So what, what for instance, Takotron 2 achieved in text-to-speech, uh, we didn't quite reach in singing. And the lack of open data sets currently, especially for English, uh, hinders a little bit the uh, reproducibility. And evaluation in general is quite a difficult problem for, for singing synthesis and the current methods are somewhat lacking, I would say. So future work would include uh, more work on complete singing synthesizers, for instance, extending the semi-supervised training to uh, pitch or other types of expression. Uh, one very important point is user control beyond just inputting a score with lyrics. So uh, there are many things that are not really uh, really encoded into a typical score, but are maybe relevant for, for a user or maybe a user would want very fine grained control. Um, recently uh, proposed diffusion models are quite an interesting alternative to both uh, autoregressive and non autoregressive models so they're they're a little bit different than both of those classes and uh, have many interesting properties another very uh, still open topic is modeling non-model voices so that would include things such as vocal fry uh, growls uh, harsh voices maybe very breathy voices and so on. So most of our models just have kind of a standard model voice, but cannot really go beyond that. 
and uh, this is quite a difficult problem. Um, another thing that's important is multilingual synthesis. So uh, especially the ability to sing some words in a different language is very useful and important. And also cross-lingual synthesis is an important topic where we can train a model in, in one language and then synthesize uh, another language. And it would be great if there are reliable and widely accepted evaluation metrics for singing synthesis, much like, for instance, the FID for image generation. Uh, that would really help um, evaluation, I would I think. And it would also be great if there are more open data sets, which does in the, like the last year, there does seem to be a lot more uh, activity in that area. So the scientific contributions include uh, one journal article and eight conference articles in conferences such as Interspeech, ICAST, SIPCO, within the PhD. And then there are eight, uh, 17 other related publications prior to starting the PhD. Um, at least 12 patents on singing synthesis as a co-inventor within an industrial research project. Uh, I've contributed to several research projects, including CASAS and TROMPA. And I've also contributed to several applications that are currently on the market, such as uh, Cantamus, which is an app for choir rehearsal by Voctro Labs, which is a company that I helped co-found and which focuses on uh, voice and speech and singing related technologies. And also, of course, Vocaloid, which is a popular end user singing synthesizer by Yamaha in Japan. Other contributions are uh, various talks, uh, posters and collaborative projects, student co-supervision and some reviews for uh, conferences and articles. So thank you very much for your attention and we can now have the Q&A.